So I'm Pam Evans. I uh, head up the marketing and development here at FSGC. Um, we are so thankful that you've taken your time to join us. This is one way that uh, we as, as a community mental health center that specializes in helping kids and families, one way that we can give back to you all as parents, caregivers, uh, because we know it is not easy these days and it's gotten harder <laughs> with COVID. Um, so we're really pleased we can can offer these free, free of charge. Um, so thanks for taking time out of your evening. A couple of housekeeping notes. Um, if you need a certificate or something that proves that you participated in this session tonight, please um, drop your first and last name in the chat. Um, chat box. I will make sure that you get those. We will email those out um, either tomorrow or early next week. Um, that is not a problem at all. So just put your first and last name. And if you want to add certificate, that's great. Um, and we are going to ask everybody to stay um, muted unless you have a question. We keep this very casual. Uh, we have a bunch of questions that were submitted in advance. But as we're going through this, we want Tonight is for you. And if you have specific questions, here is your chance to talk with someone who um, is very well versed uh, with kids with ADHD. Um, she's a, a wealth of information. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Connie Romig, who's going to lead the discussion tonight. She is the manager of our early childhood intervention program. Um, so Connie, take it away. Well, thanks, Pam. Sure. You can hear me okay. Well, like Pam said, my name is Dr. Connie Romig and I am a doctoral level psychologist at Family Service. I've worked at Family Service. It'll be 21 years on Monday. Um, very pleased to be a part of uh, FSGC and all the good work that we do. Um, like Pam said, I uh, received a bunch of questions from y'all and I tried to kind of organize them, categorize them, and um, I'm going to um, just start with um, diagnosing. So we had several great questions about diagnosis, um, diagnosing ADHD, and uh, some questions related to that. And the first one was, um, other diagnoses can present as ADHD and how can you tell the difference? Which is a fantastic question. Um, that's why I went to school for so long. So I can tell the difference between ADHD, anxiety and depression. Um, accurate diagnosing can be very, very tricky. It's not a matter of just, you know, reading down a list of symptoms and checking them off. It really is, um, considering other diagnoses, um, observing kiddos in different situations, gathering diff information from different individuals. So I, I personally, when I'm interviewing a family, um, I try to get information from the, the child's teacher, the parents, among other people. Um, because especially in younger kids, everything looks like ADHD, everything. If a kid is anxious, they can't sit still. They can't concentrate. If they're depressed, they can't concentrate. If they have trauma or uh, environmental stressors at home, um, they can look really fidgety and have a hard time concentrating. So, um, exactly everything in, especially really little kids can look like ADHD. Um, some medical conditions can even uh, resemble symptoms of ADHD. Um, some of these factors, some of these other diagnoses can coexist with ADHD as well. Um, and they may or may not be responsible for some of the symptoms. And so, for example, if a child has learning issues um, and they're not understanding information, they may present with inattention and fidgeting, fidgeting as a result of their inability to really understand the information. So it's a great question to start with. Like I said, diagnosing is really difficult. Um, it shouldn't, uh, I am, I should say, I'm very, very conservative when it comes to diagnosing, especially in little kids, because little kids are, you know, I specialize in three, four, five-year-olds. Um, they, 
present all different kinds of ways. So mental health professionals really need to obtain information from multiple sources. They really, it's, it's a doing a disservice to ch your child and to you um, if someone interviews you and says, this is what it is. Um, it really needs to be a working diagnosis. Most of us approach it as a working diagnosis as we get to know, we, ha we have to call it something obviously in order for uh, insurance to cover, um, cover the services and so on. Um, so we do the best we can. We, this is what I think it is. And then as we gather information, we try to find two diagnoses. Um, what else did I want to say about that? Um, diagnosing children is often a matter of excluding factors. So for example, example, um, when I am working with a family with a really young child, you know, two or three year old, and they're, the, the family is saying, I don't think he, I think he has ADHD. I think he, um, you know, he doesn't seem to be paying attention. He doesn't seem to be able to focus. I immediately, I send them they have to have a vision screen. They have to have a hearing screen. Let's rule out any kind of medical conditions um, that could be present. Um, but then we, there is no easy answer. Yes, things overlap. And um, it's a matter of gathering information from multiple sources. That's my answer to that question. Um, the next one I have is, does ADHD in children look similar? in teens and adults? Another great question. No, elements of ADHD often look very, very different in teens and adults. Uh, for example, adults tend to demonstrate more in a, inattention symptoms than children do, or well, I shouldn't say that. Um, it presents more as inattention in adults. And then children have more of the activity level, the fidgeting, the having to move, um, so when you're looking at a kiddo with ADHD, you can see it. Adults who have ADHD tend to experience that hyperactivity internally. It's like a feeling of restlessness. It's a, they, they don't maybe not as move as much as other as, as kids do, but they, um, they do have the symptoms. It's just more of an internal thing. So you may not be able to see it, but then some ADHD behaviors remain consistent from childhood into teenage years and through adulthoods, for example, disorganization or uh, problems attending to detail, um, you know, so maybe rushing through homework, uh, trying to organize or initiate, get motivated to start a project. Those kinds of um, symptoms tend to just follow people as they age. Another great question. I was really impressed with the questions, by the way. So uh, the third question about diagnosing, uh, related to diagnosing, it, it was, um, is ADHD like a form of sensory processing disorder? Um, again, great question. Um, ADHD and sensory processing disorder are very distinctly different. Um, sensory processing disorder is an inability to use information that's, that comes in through our senses in an order in order just to function day to day. So um, it's the way the individual, um, well, processes sensory information. Um, individual, it, sensory processing disorder is really an umbrella term. It covers a variety of sensitivities to sensory sense stimulation. So an individual can demonstrate sensitivities to any or all information that comes through the variety of senses, including touch, vision, hearing, um, taste, even body position, um, and smell, your sense of smell. Um, so some people who have sensory processing problems um, may be over responsive to certain sensory stimulation, like they can't stand to have sticky stuff on their bodies or sticky, dirty hands, or they can't tolerate um, certain textures of food. Um, a lot of times when I'm talking to families, it's um, kids can't stand the mushy food. Um, other individuals with sensory difficulties are under responsive to, sense, so to certain um, information. So for example, 
kids don't notice that their shoes are on the wrong feet, or maybe they can eat really, really spicy food and not have a reaction that most of us would. Um, and another, and still other, individuals engage in sensory seeking behaviors. They're seeking out um, certain experiences, you know, so for example, they have everything in mouth. They have a very oral fixation. They really um, get, a, they like it getting oral stimulation, <clears throat> chewing on pencils or chewing their fingernails or their shirt collars or anything really. Um, or, they crave like bear hugs. Like it's not, I have lots of kiddos who they, I come up from the lobby to get them for my, I come up into the lobby to get them for their um, session and they come flying across the lobby and come in for a hug, but they don't just come in for a hug. They come in and smash into me like that. And they really need a lot of that deep pressure. Um, so people who have sensory difficulties or sensory problems or sensory sensitivities, however you like to refer to it, um, have a comb combinations of these. So they might be over responsive to some uh, experiences, under responsive to other uh, experiences and seek out other sensory in input. Um, Sensory processing issues are typically evaluated, diagnosed, and treated by occupational therapists. Um, so, for example, in the school, um, an occupational therapist will evaluate a child's ability to hold a pencil correctly, and maybe they need to utilize, um, oh, those um, pencil grips to help the kid, kiddo kind of uh, manage <clears throat> manage holding the pencil correctly or they may use alternative um seating for kiddos who need to kind of uh rock a little bit to help them stay focused um sometimes they use yoga balls or other types of um alternative seating um so Sensory concerns are not considered mental health diagnoses, um, but they certainly overlap with or and exacerbate mental health issues, um, especially ADHD. So many people who have ADHD have overlapping sensory processing concerns. Um, and so I, um, I, I do ask, I, even though I do, do not diagnose sensory processing disorder um, issues, I will ask questions about quirky behaviors um, in kiddos, like, you know, they can't tolerate a tag. So most of us notice novel information like, oh, I got a new shirt and I noticed my tag, but eventually I habituate to it. I just notice it and, oh yeah, it's there. And then I kind of get used to it and I ignore it. A kid with sensory processing disorder will just keep like, oh my gosh, I can't, you know, they can't focus on it. They won't be able to do anything else until that tag is out of there. Um, so uh, the treatment for ADHD behaviors and the treatment for sensory processing disorders are very, very different. But like I said, kids who have ADHD can often have uh, sensory processing concerns that um, kind of exacerbate their ADHD symptoms. So great question. Um, the next section of questions um, deals with specific deal with specific symptoms or behaviors and how to manage some of those things. So I'm just trying to keep an eye on the time so I don't go too far over. Um, so one of the questions um, is how do you respond when a child cannot control his or her impulses? And I really am so thankful to the adult who wrote that question because it, it is really, they cannot control their impulses. Excuse me, there's something coming up on my phone. Okay. Oh, dang it. So sorry. There we go. All right. There we go. Um, 
I really refer, I want to refer back to this idea that I mentioned in some of our little snippets, the idea of can't behavior versus won't behavior. Often kids who have ADHD um, symptoms or behaviors, um, adults view them as being bad kids, you know, because they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, and there's a very distinct difference between a kid who won't do what they're supposed to be doing, that's an oppositional kid or a defiant kid or just a jerk, <laughs> and kids who with ADHD who can't, they can't control a lot of these behaviors. They can't remember to pack their backpack. They can't remember to take their homework home. They can't remember to turn their homework in. So can't versus won't is a very big distinction. Um, and it's really not okay to punish a child for behaviors that he, he or she cannot control. Um, however, adults can work to modify those impulsive behaviors by practicing and rewarding the desired behaviors that we want to see from kiddos. So for example, um, you know, most kids, or let's, let's just say the neurotypical kid, typically developing kiddo, you know, you teach them a couple of times to, when we approach the street, you hold a grown-up's hand, we look both ways before we cross the street, make sure there's no cars coming, and then we cross the street. With, um, with a, a child who is impulsive, has ADHD, you, you still do the teaching. You're just gonna have to do it, you over teach. You have to teach several times. You have to do, you have to break it down into very, very little steps. You have to prompt them at each, each step of the way. And then you reward them when they do um, each of the steps. So for example, um, example, another example. This is very, very common. Let's say we have a five-year-old named Joey and he really, really struggles with keeping his hands to himself when the class lines up to go out for recess. You know, he's been, he's been trying to hold it together in the classroom, trying to maintain focus, and he's just jumping out of his skin. It's time to go outside and he cannot control, control his, mo his, his hands and his movement. So the first step is identify the situation where the impulsive behavior is occurring most often. So for Joey, it's when he lines up, when the classroom, or I'm sorry, when the kids in the class line up for recess. Um, the second step is to talk to the child about the situation and not in a punishing kind of way. It's just like, wow, Joey, you know, it feels like you're really having a hard time when you have to stand in line. So we are going, and you're, you're getting into trouble often. Every time, you, you know, we, when we get in line, you can't, you're having a hard time keeping your hands to yourself and um, trying to touch, to, you know, touching your friends or pushing or whatever. Um, the third step is you over teach the desired behavior, which is keeping his hands to himself. And so does that mean every time he gets in line, do we put our hands in our pockets? Does he need this? this does the teacher ask, actually have to physically give him something to hold on to? Um, in, in our ECIP program, our little, little ones, they put bubbles on their lips. So they they do that and then they put their duck tails on. So they take their hands like this and they put them on the back of their backs um, and so that their hands are occupied. Um, so then we role play. We would role play with Joey. Let's pretend we're getting ready to go out with your class and everybody in the family lines up and we practice where our hands are gonna go. And then we reward, we remind him of all the steps and we reward him for doing it well. And then you wanna get the teacher involved too. Um, you're going to have to practice, you know, where with, with more typically developing kiddos, you do it a couple of times and they get it, right? With a, uh, an impulsive child, you're going to have to do it multiple times over and over and over over again. So you practice the, you practice the behavior um, at home, then you practice the behavior out in the community, you practice the behavior uh, at school, and you get the teacher, the teacher's input on uh, as well. Um, so over teaching is what we want to do. We want to, uh, when we punish, and we could, we can have a whole conversation about punishing. When we punish, 
um, especially kids with ADHD, they they get, you know, they, they frequently are in trouble because they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, they're getting redirected often. They're getting yelled at pretty often. Um, and if that is the message that they're hearing, you're not doing it right. You're not doing it right. Stop doing that. Do it, do it this way. Don't do it that way. Do it. Then that becomes the voice and the voice, their self-talk in their head. And it's just, I'm not doing it right. I'm no good. I never do anything right. I can't seem to please anybody. And so we want to focus on the positive. We want to help them be successful. So we're setting our kids up for success rather than trying to punish the undesired behavior out of them. It just doesn't quite quite work. Pun uh, well, we can get into that another time. The next question is, what is the best tool to maintain patience with an ADHD individual? Another fantastic question. It's also really, really tough. Um, I, I grew up with ADHD. I have three brothers who have ADHD, unmedicated ADHD. Um, uh, my husband has ADHD and one of my sons has ADHD. And I have to remind myself very often to um, take a breath and to stop and really think about what's going on in my purse. Sorry. Yes. Um, so, uh, sorry, that was my ADHD husband. Um, so and it's really important for caregivers to keep in mind that much of the time those ADHD behaviors um, are can't behaviors, not won't behaviors. Um, I also, like I said, can uh, encourage people to think about setting their loved one up for success by being supportive, um, by, by breaking things down into uh, simple steps, by reinforcing um, positive behaviors that you're looking for rather than um, nagging. So for example, your 10 year old kiddo is getting ready for school, tends to get distracted, ends up playing or gets lost along the way when they're, you know, oh, I'm supposed to be eating breakfast or I'm supposed to go brush my teeth. Um, I really encourage my families with kiddos like this to um, create a checklist of all the tasks that the kiddo is supposed to do that in the morning. Um, and that checklist lives somewhere. It, it has to stay in one place. These kids, you know, we lose things all the time. So it either lives on the fridge or it lives on the back of the bedroom door. And then the kiddo goes to it. This is what I have to do. They go do that thing. They come back. They, you know, put on your socks, put on your shoes, eat your breakfast, and they can check it off. I'm, I actually laminate ours so that they can wipe, you can use dry erase markers. Um, and instead of saying, go get dressed or get your shoes on, I try to say, okay, Joey, what's next? And that prompts them to go look at their checklist and then they can feel more successful. And then that's the voice they start hearing is what's next? Oh yeah, I have to do this now. Okay, I have to make my lunch now, or oh, I have to feed the dog now, whatever is on the checklist. Um, okay, so, Maintaining patience by focusing on those can't behaviors versus won't behaviors, and um, how do you set them up for success? Um, this is similar along the same lines. Provide some day-to-day -day tools to help coach and develop good time management skills for a child with ADHD. Another great um, request. I love checklists. I think. Um, Checklists are very useful for kiddos um, struggling with ADHD, but it has to have realistic um, times for their tasks. So for example, um, it's not just you come home from school, you sit down and you do your homework. It's come home from school, put your shoes away, unpack your lunchbox, right? You gotta do all those steps, sit, get out your homework. And I mean, they need to borrow ADHD is a um, neurodevelopmental disorder. Part of the brain just isn't as developed as more typically developing kids. And so um, kids need to borrow our prefrontal cortex. They need to borrow the prefrontal cortex of the adults around them 
to help them manage these skills. And they're called executive functioning skills, planning ahead, organization, um, that sort of thing. And so they're really go your kiddos really need to borrow your prefrontal cortex to help them with these things. It's not like um, there's a magic wand that's just gonna fix it for them. And so I also encourage, so I really like the idea of using checklists with realistic um, time. So, you know, oh, you have spelling homework. You're gonna work on that for 20 minutes. And then when that 20 minutes is over, you're gonna take a break, come on out. We're gonna, I don't know, eat dinner or whatever. Um, then you're gonna come back and we're gonna work on something else. I also encourage parents, adults to use desired activities like watching TV, playing on the tablet. I use those as rewards for completing um, undesired activities, you know, or less desirable activities like homework or household chores or whatever. So once your spelling words are done, then you can play on the tablet for 15 minutes. Um, like I said, written checklists or even picture schedules. Um, a lot of a lot of kids really need that visual prompt, not just words. Um, words help, but they also need like a picture to remind them that this is what I'm supposed to do. These are the tasks I'm supposed to do. But like I said, an adult still needs to monitor and help manage those behaviors for kids because they just don't have their brains are not fully um, developed to manage their own time well. Um, the next question is, how can I successfully discipline my child when he's doing something wrong? <laughs> um, so I'm assuming, well, this actually applies to any kid, not just kids with ADHD. Discipline really, the word discipline really means to teach, not to punish, it means to teach. And so when, um, when your child is doing something that you don't want them to do, him or her to do, we really wanna take that opportunity to redirect them and correct them and teach them what you do want them to do. So, and that's part of why punishment doesn't work if it doesn't work consistently. So let's say your kiddo is um, marking on the wall with crayons. You walk into the room and you just scream at them. And you just yell at them, stop walking on the wall. <laughs> um, you haven't taught them what they need to do, what they should be doing, right? So yes, we correct them. Hey, crayons are not for marking on the wall or your wall isn't for marking on, your wall isn't for putting you know, drawing on. You can draw on this, this notebook. I got you this notebook, this special blue notebook is just for your colors. You can draw in the special notebook. So you're teaching them what you want them to do. Um, people tend to do more of whatever other people pay attention to. So that's why class clowns continue to act up and be disruptive. As long as other people are paying attention to them, laughing at their jokes, um, they're gonna keep acting like that, right? They're gonna keep acting up. So uh, many therapists work with families to ignore annoying or harmless behaviors of children instead, and instead provide labeled praise. Labeled praise means you don't just say good job, you say, I really like how you did X, Y, Z. Um, that's labeled praise. Um, we want to provide label praise for the behaviors that the adult really, really likes or wants to see more of. Um, so uh, this actually happened the other night in the session. Um, I was working with a, a mom and a, a young guy and the young guy started to get really silly. He's, he's got ADHD behaviors and he starts sliding his chair and kind of flopping around in his chair. And I said, as an aside, I'm like, mom, we're just gonna ignore this behavior and we're gonna continue to play. And once he starts playing with us, then we're going to focus on the fact that he's playing with us. And sure enough, he did, he did the sliding the chair back and kind of flopping around in his chair two or three times. And as soon as he started playing and engaging with mom with the toys, we were like, I really like how you're playing so nice with mom, it's great. 
great. And then he stopped. We, we did not see that behavior again from him for the entire session, which was really wonderful. Um, I'm gonna go back to this idea that if an adult keeps nagging at the kiddo for doing something that they that, that the adult doesn't like the kid to do, um, neither party feels good. That doesn't feel good to me to be the, don't do this, stop doing that, please don't, or, you know, I wanna, I wanna be uh, supportive and encouraging and, um, because I don't want that to become the voice in their head. And, and we know um, research shows kids with ADHD tend to have very low self-esteem because they're constantly being redirected. They're constantly, you know, or being yelled at <laughs> um, or they're labeled the bad kid because they're not doing what most of the other kids are doing. And so I don't want my kid or your kid. I don't want them to walk around with that in their head. I want them to hear, I can do this, or I just have to break it down. Or what would mom say? <laughs> what would mom say right now to me? Um, I, I tell my kiddo all the time, you can do hard things. We can do hard things. We can do this. Um, when he starts to get frustrated, which is another question that I uh, have here too. So we'll, we'll mention that again. Um, can sleep deprivation in children affect an ADHD diagnosis? Um, well, yeah, <laughs> I guess. Um, we, poor sleep can make all sorts of behavior problems worse, right? Um, if I don't get enough sleep, I'm really not good for much of anything. So when I am interviewing families, when I'm meeting them in an admission process, I always ask about sleep. And when I'm training my clinicians, I supervise um, clinicians who specialize in zero to six year old children, um, I encourage them, like always ask about sleep patterns. Like not just, hey, does your kid get enough sleep? When is bedtime? Do they go to bed on time? Do they fall asleep? Do they stay asleep? What time do they wake up? Do they wake up on their own? Um, do they get up in the middle of the night and have a hard time falling back to sleep? We really want to know, we really want to understand, excuse me, we really want to understand their sleep patterns because of course that affects sleep. Um, one of our kiddos, um, right now we're working with, he's only getting two or three hours of sleep at a time. And he is basically jumping out of his skin, this poor little guy. It's really hard to watch. So we really want to work on sleep hygiene behaviors um, because sleep is so, we, we start with sleep hygiene behaviors before we start targeting those problem ADHD behaviors because if, if, if the kiddo gets better sleep, those problematic behaviors may actually get better on their own. So healthy high sleep hygiene involves creating and implementing a predictable bedtime routine to signify, hey, bedtime's coming. It's, start to, it's, it's time to start quieting our minds. It's time to start quieting our bodies. Um, it definitely involves turning off screens. I know people, <laughs> people say, oh, but he, he falls asleep so much better in front of a screen. Um, uh, somebody in this household, I won't name names, but somebody in this household also says that he has to sleep in front of a TV, it helps him sleep. Research shows us that both active television watching or screen watching and passive screen watching, which is when you fall asleep in front of a screen, impacts brain waves and your, um, um, your, your, your sleep states. We actually have predictable sleep states where you move from um, stage one to three, two to three to REM and then back up again. It's, it's very predictable. Typical sleep is, but when we are, when television is on or when a screen is on and we are sleeping with that screen on, that impacts our, our, our ability to get good sleep as well. And so shutting off screens is very important, possibly playing some kind of quiet or soothing music or some other, some kids or families, uh, like some kind of sound machine, or I particularly like fans because it, it's like a white noise, you know, taking a bath or having shower time. Sometimes lotioning kiddos helps them to calm. 
reading or some other quiet activities to help um, to help kind of quiet down and kind of get in that you know, snuggling in kind of um, that helps the body and the mind to prepare for sleep. And kiddos can't do it on their own. They're, they just aren't. If you have a baby, you know, you have to help them fall asleep. Um, excuse me. So um, also I, I highly recommend if you aren't familiar with how much sleep your child needs, you can easily Google, get online, Google, hey, how much sleep does a 10 year old need? 10 year, 10 year olds need about eight to 10 hours of sleep a night. Um, so I would double check on that because some people aren't familiar with that. Um, okay, next, next request is suggestions to keep a child with ADHD on task and remember what to do, what they need to do. Again, uh, this is often a can't behavior in children with ADHD. It's not a won't behavior, it's a can't behavior. And so adults really need to have realistic expectations for their child and make accommodations to set that kid, your kiddo up for success. Again, provide that labeled praise for on task behavior. I see, hey, we've been working on your spelling words for 10 minutes straight, that's fantastic. Catch him or her doing what you want him to do or her to do um, and notice it, say something about it. I really seeing how hard you are. You really seem to like this book. You know, you're really paying attention while I'm reading this book to you. I also, again, encourage the use of checklists, help kiddos remember, and checking that off. I don't know about you all. I'm a paper pencil person. I do checklists. Pam is nodding her head. I know she's a to-do list person too. There's a very big sense of accomplishment, and, um, and that's, a, that's really good feedback to the kiddo. I did this. This is done. Um, Obviously breaking tasks down into small steps, rewarding for those small steps and giving kids breaks. We really can't expect, um, you know, you can't expect your five-year-old, you can't take your five-year-old into their room and say, clean your room and then leave and expect them to do it, right? We need to say, okay, buddy, let's get all the clothes off the floor. Let's shoot them into your hamper like basketball and, and you have to kind of help them. They, they're gonna need your help. Now we're gonna pick up all your cars and they're gonna go in this basket, pick up all the cars. Now we're gonna pick up all your balls, put them in this basket. We have to break it down for them and uh, make it realistic. Um, and we can't expect them to stay on task without some prompts and some encouragement. Okay, the next question is it just says symptoms and girls question mark <laughs> um that is another difficult question um the dsm the diagnostic and statistical manual um for psychological disorders uh indicates that girls are more likely to present with inattentive features so they're the they're gonna get lost in the classroom they're gonna kind of daydream or um um you know, kind of get preoccupied or distracted with noises in the hallway or what's going on with their shoes or whatever. Um, however, I do really want to emphasize that I could have 50 kids in the cafeteria all diagnosed with ADHD and all of, it doesn't matter, they're boys or girls or what, um, but they could all present very, very differently um, because ADHD is really, um, well, there are three, three kinds of ADHD. There's hyperactive impulsive type, pre predominantly hyperactive impulsive presentation. There's predominantly inattentive presentation, and then there's a combined presentation. But, um, you know, there are probably 15 total different kinds of behaviors that we expect to see, including disorganization, forgetting things, you know, leaving their backpack places. Um, easily distracted, um, that sort of thing. Um, so kids can come in with a variety of those behaviors and be considered AD, be considered to have ADHD. So not no one is going to look the same with ADHD. Um, the next question is, 
is there anything to help with aggression and impulsiveness? And I kind of mentioned, I kind of addressed impulsive, impulsiveness, but believe it or not, aggression is not technically a symptom of ADHD. However, kids with ADHD may react with aggression because they get so frustrated for a variety of reasons. Um, they get frustrated because their brain doesn't seem to be working. Um, recently happened, um, overheard a kiddo talking to himself after being redirected. Um, and he was in, he went to the bathroom and I overheard the bathroom and I heard him saying you are so stupid I mean he was just so frustrated with himself um some younger kiddos may not be able to control that frustration and they may act out towards others again I want to I would want parents adults to focus on the behaviors you want to see and provide labeled praise for those behaviors I also want would want um, when you're noticing a kid, kiddo, get, any kiddo getting frustrated, we want to give them a break. We want to take them out of the situation, give them a five, 10 minute break, even giving them a pep talk. Tell me what's going on. How are you feeling? Let's take some deep breaths. Um, you know, are they frustrated with the work that they're, the academic work that they're working on? Are they frustrated because somebody's sitting next to them doing this? He probably also has ADHD, <laughs> some ADHD symptoms. Um, do they just need a break um, from whatever is going on around them? And then giving them that pep talk that you can do these things, we can work on this, we can make this happen, and then um, rejoin whatever the activity is. Um, ouch. Trying to um, correct aggression with spanking or other forms of physical uh, punishment is really confusing and um, tends, it might work for the moment, you know, it, it might work in that moment, but we really wanna focus on teaching your child what to do instead of just focusing on stop doing this. Um, this next question is a little bit more involved. It's pretty specific, kind of specific, but I could see where you can apply it to lots of different things. Um, it says, any great tips to help when a child wants to be involved in an extracurricular activity, but struggles to put in the work to practice because it's overwhelming. And they noted, we try to break it down, but almost, uh, it tends to encounter, they become, the child becomes overwhelmed. Sometimes coaches aren't able to break down tasks or drills in a way that makes sense to a child with ADHD. And then the kiddo gets overwhelmed and then they get frustrated. Well, it really does sound like the parents are on the right, the adults in the situation are get on the right track, breaking down, well, first and foremost, <laughs> when, a, when any kiddo wants to get, wants to engage in an extracurricular activity, it's really important, whatever the age is, it's really, really important to like lay out what the expectation will be for that extracurricular activity. Um, you know, if they want to play a violin, for example, or the piano, you know, yeah, you get to it looks really great to get up there and play the piano, but you really have to practice every day, at least this long. And you have piano lessons every week. Um, and, um, you know, you're gonna have, at the end of the year, you have to get up and play in a recital or whatever, whatever the expectations are, because you really wanna, kids get just really excited about oh, I'm going to get to play an instrument or I get to run around the soccer field and kick the ball really hard. But we really want to um, lay out the clear expectations. What is this going to entail? You're going to have to, on this baseball team, you have to commit to practicing three times a week and then playing games on Saturday, whatever it is, Saturday and Sunday, whatever it is, um, so that they have a realistic view of what that extracurricular activity entails. The next step is then to break down the drills and the practices into smaller steps. I have a kiddo who plays soccer. He does not want to practice. <laughs> he, does, he doesn't want to practice. Um, so we have to make it playful. 
for him, right? We get out there. I'm not, I'm no good at soccer, but I get out there and run around. He thinks that's hysterical. I'm out there running around trying to dri dribble with my feet and kicking, passing the ball to him and him passing the ball back to me and, and um, you know, making it fun, uh, making it playful. Um, I also like the idea of taking a one down approach and having your child teach you what they're learning, whether it's, um, you know, a piano skip scale or, um, you know, um, a dance step or a dance part of a dance um, part of a dance if they're in dance or whatever gymnastics they're learning that week, like te have them teach you. That's a great way, a great way to reinforce what they're learning by, by teaching someone else. Um, it's also great to talk with your child's coach or teacher or piano instructor, or whoever, about your child's um, challenges um, so that coaches, teachers also have realistic expectations of your child. Um, and also adjust your own expectations, right? Um, I can't, well, I'm not gonna, I can't say enough about uh, martial arts for young children um, of all age, of, of all developing abilities, ADHD, not ADHD. Um, I can't say enough about it. It teaches self-control and um, it, it really is a positive experience. Um, for kiddos and I will plug Master Overby. He's, he's really, really wonderful. He actually comes to classrooms and um, we'll do a little presentation in different uh, elementary school classrooms to encourage kiddos to try it. Um, but anyway, uh, my ADHD is kicking in and I'm being tangential. Oh gosh, we don't have much more time. Um, uh, the next question I kind of address is how do I help my 12 year old navigate feeling frustrated with themselves? Um, it is helpful to know that they have ADHD, which is new to this family apparently, um, but the kid often compares himself to peers who don't seem to struggle so much with certain things. Um, the kiddo is getting so frustrated, frustrated with being reminded to stay on task for school, schoolwork, and then they really uh, can become self-critical. Yeah. Um, I already mentioned children with ADHD often have significantly lower self-esteem than children without ADHD and why it's because people are correcting them or nagging them or they're often getting into trouble for doing what they're not supposed to be doing. So it's really, really important to notice their effort, notice how hard they're working and um, focus on, again, label praise. I'm really, I really love how, how much you are interested in, I don't know, whatever the topic of their presentation is or whatever um, math work they're doing. Um, as adults, we become that voice and the, the conscience, we become their conscience and they, that voice in their head that tells them you should do this or don't do that. Um, and if, if they're around adults who are constantly critical of them, then the child develops that critical self-talk, like just kind of be, really beating themselves up and being down on themselves. So create a plan with your 12 year old to help him with those tasks or her tasks. Again, checklists, visual reminders, verbal reminders, what comes next? Okay, now what do you have to do? Putting alarms on phones, alarms on tablets. Um, my own kiddo had um, in his classroom, um, his teacher set alarms on his Chromebook for him that helped remind him, now it's time to put your homework in your backpack. Now, or now it's time to take your homework out and hand it in. Um, it was really, really great. And then rewarding them, noticing, hey, you handed in your homework today. That's fantastic. Um, and like I said, I use the phrase, we can do hard things. You can do this when you're frustrated. Um, I kind of, okay, I'm going to jump down, um, to some medication. Well, one, 
a medication question. Um, the one, um, one question that came in is, do you have any advice for co-parenting situations where one parent feels ADHD meds are beneficial and the other parent feels that they are harmful? Um, this happens quite frequently. And in fact, at our facility, our psychiatrist, and I'm, I'm not a medication provider, I'm a psychologist, which means I'm a talking doctor, not a medical doctor. And um, at our facility, our psychiatry staff really emphasize having co both parents on board um, for treatment. Um, I will say, um, well, I, I will say gathering data, like if teachers, so one parent is saying, we don't, I don't want them on medication. The other parent is saying, you know, I see that it's helpful. Um, it's, I think it's really helpful to get teacher information. So um, it, teachers don't, don't know if your kiddo had medication that day or not. Um, you can just ask, how was Joey today? How did he do today? Was he focused? Was he, you know, whatever. Um, and you just gather that kind of data. It's kind of objective data to show, yeah, look, he's doing better on his medication or whatever. Another uh, really great question that I get quite often is at what point should we consider um, medication for ADHD? And I am not, actually most of us at Family Service and Guidance Center, none of us at Family Service and Guidance Center really want to put kids on medication. We do try to do as much behavioral work as we can before we turn to medication. If it's at all reasonable or possible, we try to do behavioral interventions. Um, research shows that actually the best fit is behavioral interventions with medication. Um, rather than either by themselves. Um, but we do try to do behavioral interventions first, just to see. Maybe some kids do respond really well to just the behavioral intervention. Um, but when do we decide, or when should an adult parent, a co caregiver, decide, hey, um, maybe medication is what's warranted for our kiddo? Well, first, um, again, gathering data. How is this kiddo? particularly doing in school, I, is this, is, I'm sorry, are these behaviors and symptoms interfering with my child's ability to learn um, or to perform at where I think he's capable of performing academically? I think that personally uh, and professionally, I, I think that is a, uh, the standard to go by. Like if, if I feel like he's really impacting his ability to demonstrate knowledge and skills uh, at, in, in school, particularly, that would be where I would consider medication. The other, there's plenty of options. Um, you can uh, certainly talk to a, just because you talk to a psychiatric um, provider does not mean you have to put your kid on medication. You can go and get information about what is out there? Um, do these behaviors seem to warrant medication? Um, is there medication that would address these kinds of behaviors? Um, and it doesn't mean you have to do it. You, you have to give them that medication. It means you're gathering information. Um, okay, we have about six minutes left, Pam. What do you wanna do? So we do have one question uh, that popped up in the chat. So it, it surrounds how to keep your kiddo organized. Their room, a 12 year old's room can go from absolutely perfect looking to, to looking like it has never been clean in just a really short span. Um, absolutely, okay. Um, I, I have a kiddo uh, that I work with who, whose, whose room is like this. <laughs> um, one thing we did was we took a lot of stuff out of his room. 
we, um, you know, he had a lot of clothes. He had all of his winter clothes in there. And he, this is a kiddo who likes to change his clothes a lot. We, um, mom and adults took a lot of stuff out of his room. They're giving him maybe five to 10 um, outfits to keep in his room at a time so that they're not all over the floor. Um, th this family actually created a situation so the kiddo cannot stuff things under his bed. Mm. Um, for this kiddo, they put his mattress on the floor, but you can actually you know, create um, like a box around your bed so that things can't get shoved underneath there. <laughs> um, another, again, we have to consider our expectations, right? You, um, what, what is the expectation? It's my expectation on perfection. I want all the red Legos in one bin and all the orange Legos in another bin. That's not going to happen. Um, but, you know, clearly stating what the expectations are. So um, clothes go in the hamper, not on the floor. You know, we can, we can write out these rules and, and as your child is cleaning up, he can check them off again, that sense of accomplishment. You know, I also really, for some families, that is not a battle to fight. And you can shut the door and don't look at it. <laughs> that's another option. It's just not to not to worry about it. Just keep, if that's that's the way he wants to live, that's the way you can shut the door and not think about it. But um, I also just encourage families um, instead of trying to have everything nicely organized, maybe having one big box for all the toys, one big hamper for all the dirty clothes. Um, if your kiddo really struggles to keep things on hangers in the closet. Well, it, stuffing them in the, you know, in the dresser is better than don't, don't hang them up, put them in the dresser. What really fine tune it to your child's um, strengths. Um, and, you know, the other thing I have worked with families on uh, is, you know, he really hates to clean his room, but he really, really likes to wash the car you know what, send him out to wash the car and you clean his room. I mean, we really, you know, focus on, instead of fighting with him for four hours to clean his room, send him out, have him wash the car and you pick up his room or you help him with cleaning up his room. You know, he really does need that prefrontal cortex of yours to help him stay organized and, and picked up. So there's just lots of ways you can approach the situation. Very good. Very good. Anybody else have any questions um, that have have maybe popped into your mind as as Dr. Roaming's been talking or or that you'd like to ask? If you would like to go ahead and unmute and go go ahead and ask real quickly. Have you um, do you know anything about the Amon Clinics? Uh, or Amen Clinics and that doctor's book, uh, Healing ADD. Have you read that? I have not. Okay. I was going to ask if your opinion, but that's okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no. Anybody else? I do have a really great resource for folks. This I tend to use this book quite, I do not make any money off of this book at all. I just, this is something that I use with many of my families, kids with ADHD or not. It's called Smart But Scattered. And it helps, um, uh, it helps organize around executive functioning skills. What I really love about this book, and I was just talking to a family about this yesterday, is there's a there's a quiz that you take and you rate your own skills around executive functioning skills. Many kids who have ADHD have parents who have ADHD, just runs in the family. So you rate your skills. You also rate your child's skills. So guess what? If you're you are really bad at organizing things, you're not going to work with your kid around organizing things if that's a weakness of his, right? You're gonna have to ask your sister or your 
mother or somebody else to help with that, somebody who is good at that. So you're not create, you're not setting yourself up for failure. Then the other thing I really love about this book is each of the chapters addresses a specific exec executive functioning skill. So for example, building response inhibition, people were asking about impulsivity and, and how to manage that. So there's a whole chapter on that. And then there are, in each chapter, there's lots of um, behavioral charts, you know, so you don't have to recreate the wheel. You don't have to create, re figure out how, how do I reward this behavior? There's all kinds of great um, resources in this book. So I highly recommend it. You can find it on Amazon, it's probably at the library as well. Very good. Very good. And, you know, one thing, um, when I first started working here at FSGC, I had no mental health um, illness information background. Um, I'm just a marketing person. And one thing has stuck with me from very, very early on. I had a clinician tell me, you know, kids don't wake up in the morning. Your, your kid doesn't wake up in the morning and think, I'm going to get in trouble or I'm going to make mom, mom or dad mad. And that had, it just framed everything a little differently for me as a parent and knowing, you know, you provided some great information, Connie, about this, this is, we're talking about an issues, challenges with brain development. ADHD just isn't a, a kid doing something to be a pain. Um, and, and let me say, I had a sensory processing challenged uh, child uh, who did not test ADHD, but was hyper as could be. Um, I remember those days too. <laughs> I mean, but in those really difficult moments, trying to, you know, you talked about how do you have the patience? How do you calm yourself down? Um, just trying to keep those, those things in the back of your mind, because they're just little humans trying to figure things out and learn. So, well, very good. Great way to end. Well, thank you. Well, <laughs> Dr. Romick, thank you so much. Thank you to everyone who joined us tonight. As I said, we will get these certificates mail, uh, emailed back out to you either tomorrow or Monday. And if you know of anybody um, who might be um, the parent or uh, loved one caregiver for someone with ADHD, um, or other mental health challenges, I encourage you to um, share, you know, recommend for them to check out our website, Facebook. We have a lot of great resources there too. So um, thank you so much and have a great rest of the week and even better weekend. Thank you. Thanks.